today, my box I'm going to show you is about big like this. Benthic foraminiferal microhabitats, I'm sure that most of you don't have the slightest idea what it is. It's a very small box, so why am I showing you such a small box? But first of all, the best way to get out of, a box, of your own box is to look, of course, at the box of other people, to look what is in their box. That's already a first step to go outside the box. So that's why I'm going today to show you my very tiny box. And here it is. This is a very nice view who was made by Gerhard Schmiedel from University of Bonn, a cartoon I really love. And here you see basically what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about benthic foraminifera, unicellular organisms, which have two main niches. First of all, on the top you see plankton, planktonic foraminifera, here. And then, of course, you see at the bottom part of this cartoon, you see four benthic foraminifera. And these four benthic foraminifera, they will be the topic of today's talk. And they are not for nothing, they are four types. They represent four different niches on the sea floor. You see, first of all, you see the one with the, with the big eyes. Well, of course, they, are, they don't really look like that. I, I think you, you understand that they, this is really a cartoon, so this is completely made up. They don't have teeth. They are unicellular, so even in spite of them being very complex, they are not as complex as that. So this is a little bit exaggerated. But we do have foraminifera which are supposed to live on top of the sediment, which we call epifaunal or epibenthic. Next, we have one group which lives at the interface of the sediment and the water column. And then we have two groups living deeper in the sediment, which we call infaunal and which we call intermediate infaunal and deep infaunal which makes in all five fundamental niches, which are really different. And I'm going to talk to you about the differences. In what aspects do these niches differ? And the animals which inhabit them, why do we have such a microhabitat separation? So that's the topic of today. And why should that be relevant to you? That's, of course, the next question. Why should you listen to me? Because it's Looks like a very small box indeed, I agree. Well, there are several reasons. First of all, I think it's a very exciting story. These things are really interesting. Foraminifera are very exciting single-celled organisms. But that's not enough. Of course, today, nobody is going to fund you if you tell that they are interesting. Should be more. So what else is so interesting about foraminifera? Well, maybe you don't realize, but about three quarters what we know of the, the history of climate over the last 60 million years is based on the study of foraminifera. And I don't think I'm exaggerating. And that's mainly based on the chemistry of the shells of these foraminifera, which are made of several materials, but many of the species, and there are about four or five thousand different species today. Many of these species have a shell which is made of calcium carbonate and the composition, the chemical composition of the shell is varying in function of the environment in which these species live. So these shells are used to reconstruct paleoclimate, paleoenvironment, and much of our knowledge of ancient climate is based on foraminifera and on the chemistry of these shells. So they are big players in this part of science. Next, they are unicellular. In spite of that, they have a large complexity, but they still behave in a predictable way. At least that's what I hope and what I think. And if we can predict the way they move and they are distributed in this sediment layer, and here I'm talking about a couple of centimeters. All this 
This is five centimeters, let's say, of the upper sediment layer where these animals, or these organisms, sorry, live. If we can predict how this works, and now we are coming to the modeling part, then we will have understood a little bit more about life. Because every one of these four or five groups, if we include the planktonics, they, they are going to choose their situation in response to environmental parameters. They behave in a way as chemical species, as you will say, in close connection with the biogeochemical conditions we find in the sediment. So I think for that, it may be interesting for all of you to have a look in my little box today. Okay, so this is the questions, these are the questions we are going to address. Where do they live? And now we're going to look in detail. Where do they calcify? That's of course very important for the people who use their shell to reconstruct paleoclimate. It's a major question to understand where exactly in what geochemical environment the shell is formed and under what conditions. And of course, a much more important question is why do they live where they live? And why do they are interesting? I hope I already convinced you. If not, I have 40 more minutes to try to do so. So first, we'll have a look at some data. So here we are somewhere in the Bay of Biscay, at about 500 meters water depth on the seafloor, and in the left panel you see these are muddy sediments and the oxygen penetration in red is quite superficial. It's more or less one and a half centimeter which is oxygenated, like this. And then underneath the oxygen is oxidizing ammonia. We have formation of nitrate and you see there in green there's nitrate present down to about two and a half centimeters. And now I show you the five main species of foraminifera in the upper five centimeter of the sediment. And you see simply that there are three groups. You have one group which is essentially found in the topmost centimeter, which we would call shallow informal. Next we have an orange species which is sitting slightly deeper which is found where we have the maximum of nitrates most of the time, which we call intermediate informal. And we have a last species which is living in completely anoxic sediment, which we call deep informal. Now from a paleoceanography point of view, of course this is already very important knowledge because these five different species will register completely different things. Here you see one single chemical parameter. This is the stable isotope ratio between 13C and 12C in the carbonate shell. And we see there's a very nice gradient in the sediment, which is registered by these species. And this is true for many other chemical uh, proponents. So the first part of my talk, we will consider each of these four groups. And I start with the epifaunal species, the epifaunal niches. Now these are the ideal species for the paleoceanographers because they are supposed to live not in the sediment and a lot of complex things go on into the sediment, but they live somewhere on an elevated substrate in the water column, a couple of centimeters above the sediment. So they are supposed to register exactly what is going on in the oceanic bottom waters. And that's what climate modelers want to know. So these are the really the things that our colleague geochemists want to have to measure in their complex machines. Now, of course, these things exist. You have sometimes you find foraminifera which are living on sponges or on stones or on whatever hard substrate is present, but the term is very often misused because these species, they don't always live on elevated substrates. Very often you will find them also within the sediment. 
And once they are fossil, there's of course no way to tell where they lived. Now here you see some geochemical measurements on a Cibicidoides, which is supposed to be one of these epifaunal genera, and which is very often used for reconstruction of former ocean bottom waters, because it is supposed to register, register those perfectly well. And here you see some chemical components in the shell, where 10 consecutive chambers have been measured by laser ablation ICPMS. And what is interesting is the manganese at the upper right box. You see that most of the chambers are quite low in manganese, but somewhere chamber number six has a much higher concentration in manganese, about one order of magnitude higher. And we think that this is a very good indication that this animal did not live all its life at the sediment surface or even on an elevated substrate. But when it made chambers number six and seven, it was very probably deeper down in the sediment where the manganese concentration increases in an important way. And this I'm showing you to tell that when geochemists say they measure strictly epifaunal species, that's probably not true. All these things have also somewhere a potter, poor water uh, imprint. Next, it is very questionable when you have a very muddy sediment, it's not easy to define where is the interface between the sediment and the water column. Because what happens is simply that the water content is extremely important on the top of your sediment. And when you put an electrode in it, it's very difficult to define where exactly is the limit between the sediment and the sediment water interface. So is there really, when you have a mud, are there any elevated microhabitats? Probably not. You need a hard, a hard object for that. Now, from a functional niche point of view, most of these epifaunal taxa are suspension feeders. Of course, they have a role to play. Why do they sit on elevated substrates? Because the bottom water current pass and there are particles in the bottom water and they filter them. Suspension feeders, and when there's a lot of those animals in the fauna of these species, it is rather thought indicative of strong bottom currents transporting suspended uh, organic carbon. So what are the ecological requirements of such species? Well, traditionally it, it is thought that they need elevated oxygen concentrations because when you go down in the sediment, we have seen that the oxygen concentration goes down very quickly. So a lot of people have used those to reconstruct bottom water oxygen concentration, but today, as I will show you in a moment, we know that it doesn't work. Most of those species are quite resistant, actually, to low oxygen concentrations, even if we find them, most of the time, in environments with much higher oxygen concentration. On the contrary, they do need an elevated food availability. So the second group is the group of shallow infernal niches. So they would be second best when we are interested to see how oceanic bottom waters changed through time. They are sitting more or less around the sediment water interface, around the sediment at the topmost sediment. Very often these things are called incorrectly epifaunal, which is not the case. They are rather deposit feeders. They are moving through the sediment and picking up, picking up all organic particles they can find. Very often they are indicative of the presence of high quality organic carbon either. The dominant taxa, which dominate the assemblages, here you see some of them, they are sometimes very beautiful of course. They have an opportunistic nature because they respond in a very clear way by reproduction, by growth to the input of large quantities of organic matter at the ocean floor. So their presence 
may clearly be very episodic, and here we talk about the pelagic benthic coupling, when we have a large production event in the surface waters. Some weeks later, a lot of the debris, the leftovers of this planktonic production will fall on the seafloor, and then there will be a strong response, even at thousands of meters of depth, even at 5,000 meters depth on the ocean floor, there will be a strong reproductive and growth response of certain opportunistic taxa. And that's important because when you look at the geochemistry of such shells, you, can, you should keep in mind that maybe all specimens you will find in a fossil record, they will be indicative of very specific high productivity periods when we had a very short and strong flux of organic material down to the ocean floor. Another geochemical problem, some of these species may perhaps simply colonize phytodetritus deposits. During such high productivity periods in the surface waters, you have marine snow, and you can have quite extensive layers of organic detritus which fall through the water column, which arrive at the seafloor, a couple centimeter thick, and these layers full of organic material will be colonized by these opportunistic species. And of course, within such a layer of organic detritus, you have a very specific geochemical environment. So for instance, the carbon isotopes may be very different. They are strongly enriched in carbon-12, which is preferred by all planktonic organisms. And that's what has been termed the Mackensen effect to explain why the delta C13 is very light in some of these species during certain periods. So what are the ecological requirements of these shallow informal species? Do they need elevated oxygen concentration? What has been thought? Because they live generally in sediment layers which are well oxygenated? No. In a moment I will show you the evidence why they don't need it. Do they need an elevated food quality? Yes, certainly. So here you will see why we have come progressively to the understanding that supplies of organic matter, that the quality and the quantity of the organic matter is a much more important structuring factor than oxygen. Here you see the same 500 meter deep station in the Bay of Biscay, sampled twice, once in October 97, a couple of weeks after an important autumn phytoplankton bloom, and once in July 98, exactly the same site, and in midsummer, conditions are extremely poor at this site. There is nearly no plankton production because the system has run out of nutrients. So there is our main production peaks in early spring, and spring in the Bay of Biscay starts already at the end of February, beginning of March. Then we have secondary blooms in autumn, but uh, summer is very poor. So here you see now that the oxygen penetration depths is almost the same. You see oxygen is going down to about two centimeters, but for all these species, you see in July we have quite poor uh, standing stocks, mainly concentrated in the first half centimeter of the sediment. And when there has been an important supply of organic detritus, you see that all these superficial species go down till one and a half centimeter, more or less, and the standing stocks increase in a very important way. So we see here clearly the impact of food input, and apparently oxygen doesn't really play a role, because when we go down from zero till two centimeter, oxygen is going down quite rapidly, as I showed on the first slide. So the organisms which are sitting there between one and one and a half centimeter, they are present in sediments which are very poorly oxygenated. And they are there nevertheless, because 
there's a food availability. Still deeper down in the sediment, we are coming to the intermediate infernal niches. Very often it's, well, between one and three centimeters depth. Here we have, when we are studying the geochemistry, now we have a very strong imprint of the pore water chemistry. These things are not at all registrating what's going on in the oceanic bottom waters. Sorry. <laughs> but they are rather registrating, of course, what's going on within the sediment. They are registrating some, some, something else, something entirely different. And as I told you before, the specific, they are very specific because these species are always found in a zone where nitrate concentration is maximal. And the question, of course, is why? What is the link between foraminifera and nitrate? So here we see again this, uh, this is another station in the Bay of Biscay, about 1,000 meter depth. You see that oxygen penetration, it's the curve in the upper panel to the left, is about two centimeter. And then we have a maximum of nitrate between half a centimeter and three centimeter depth. And here you see the foraminiferal distribution. And now we see very nicely this violet species. And you see that it's a little bit at the surface, but in small quantities. The big, the main part of the population is sitting between a half and one and a half centimeter. And at the same time, you can see a species which we'll see in a minute. This is a deep informal species which is living in completely anoxic sediment. So these organisms are probably living as deposit feeders, but of course they have to be tolerant for relatively low quality organic matter. Because when we go down from the top of the sediment into the sediment, organic matter is progressively used by all benthic organisms, and the most reactive parts are used first. So the deeper we go down into the sediment, the lower, the worse becomes the quality of the organic matter, because progressively only the less reactive organic particles are remaining. So we are sure that these animals must be more tolerant to a lower quality type of organic matter. And we do have some proof for that as well. Next, we have, of course, a problem with respiration. Formerly, we thought that all foraminifera were more or less aerobic, but we got more and more evidence of living populations in anoxic sediments, so progressively the ID arrived that maybe some of those species should be capable to have an anaerobic metabolism. And in this case, because we are living in a zone with a lot of nitrate, this could be nitrate respiration, which was, until 10 years ago, unknown in eukaryote protozoans, like the foraminifera. I will come back on that. So what are the ecological requirements of the different species living there? Elevated oxygen concentration, evidently no, because oxygen is quite low. Low oxygen concentration, do they, are they dependent on low oxygen concentration? Or can they also live in higher oxygen concentration? Well, we know they can, but they don't do it, and that's probably because of competition. Apparently, in oxic environments, these species are not as competitive as other ones. Do they need an elevated food quality of... Do they need a high food quality? Apparently, no. Everything, all our observations in the field say the contrary. We think they are dependent of a bacterially mediated food source so that there's a first step of organic mineralization which is done by bacteria and then these foraminifera could either feed on the partially degraded organic matter or directly on the bacteria themselves. Last question, important for paleoceanography, where exactly 
Do they calcify? Do they calcify deep in the sediment in anoxic conditions? Or do, perhaps, do they calcify closer to the sediment surface where they sit during some parts of their life cycle? What do we have here? Ah, this is a little bit out of place. Here we show you some in situ cores, and here I think we are back at 500 meter water depths in the Bay of Biscay. By the way, in the first slide I only gave my name, but the work I'm showing you here is at least of 15 different persons. And little by little you will see their names appear. So this is work of Christine Barras of our lab. So here you see three in situ cores, which were taken in the field. You see there is some patchiness but not that much. The dominant species are about the same. The density as well. Johan Hohenegger worked on this as well, together with us. You remember Johan? <laughs> and this is another study, which you did well, involved. This is the same site, and those are four cores. I think we forget them in an incubator in the lab for a couple of years. So two years later, when, hey, we still have those cores. Let's have a look what's in it. And now you will see that there are clear differences between the field cores and the cores which we kept two years in our lab. What we see is that the overall density went down, but what we see as well is that some species disappeared, either completely or more or less. And that, of course, is telling us something about the dependency on the quality of the food. Since we never put food in these cores, they simply went on, went on, but they impoverished over a two-year period because there was no food introduced. And you see now that Cibicidoides pachydermis, and that was the first group I showed you, the surface, really surface dwellers, which are most dependent on fresh food input, they completely disappeared. So, whereas the same is true for Uvigirina peregrina, which is an opportunistic species of the second group, and we see that all deeper living species, they remained in the system, and the deepest one is the blue one here. That's an intermediate infaunal species which normally lives deep in the sediment, and you see this species increased its density in a quite important way. So that's again an example which shows the importance of food quality. Some species are quite tolerant, for low food quality, whereas others are not at all. And here we see what went on in, when we look at the vertical distribution. So this is the course we sampled in the field, where you see that oxygen penetration is about three centimeters, two and a half. Nice uh, distribution of different species. After two years, you see that oxygen is still at two centimeters, but that main part of the living population is sitting now at the sediment surface. That's where the recycling of the organic matter is without any doubt most extensive, whereas deeper down there was only very low quality organic material present. Fourth group, we are going to the deep informal niches. So now we are going to look at species which live in anoxic sediments. Of course, there is a large influence of pore water chemistry there. So these species live around and below the zero oxygen level. They may be deposit lead feeders. Apparently, they are, they are tolerant of very low quality organic carbon. Maybe there's a relation with nitrate. I will come back of that. And they must have some other type of metabolism. They cannot be aerobic. So then the first thing people have thought of is nitrate respiration. So what are their ecological requirements? Well, elevated oxygen concentration, certainly not. But do they need low oxygen concentration? Well, that's a good question. Until now, we have few observations of these things in well-oxygenated ecosystems. Elevated food quality, probably not. Maybe there's a relation with bacteria. And also here the question is, where do they calcify? And another question is, 
were they all alive? Because now we have to go into our methods. This is the most usually, the method we use normally, which is a staining method with rose bengal, which is often used for benthic organisms. But it's not such a very critical method because rose bengal is staining essential, essentially proteins which can be preserved for quite some time, especially in anoxic conditions. So today we shift to more critical methods which fully confirm that indeed these things are alive. So with these four different microhabitats, which I shortly introduced, in 95, together with Johan Wiedmark and Henko de Stichter, I proposed kind of a conceptual model, which was called the Trox model, and which shows more or less the vertical distribution in the sediment of these foraminifera in function of two different things. First of all, a critical oxygen level, which was more or less the, oxy the zero oxygen, which is here. And second is a critical food level. And of course, food arrives in the sediment by bioturbation of macrofauna. And here we go from an oligotrophic ecosystem at the left to a eutrophic ecosystem at the right. And what we see now basically, that in oligotrophic ecosystems, you see that life is concentrated in the top millimeters of the sediment. Here we are at the ocean floor, the abyssal plain, at five kilometers depth. When we go to very eutrophic ecosystems, we see the same. Again, food is limited to the sediment surface, but now for another reason, that the whole succession of redox front is strongly compressed. Oxygen only penetrates a couple of millimeters, and that means that all the niches are compressed as well. And in the middle, in what we call here mesotrophic ecosystems, there we find the deepest penetration of organisms in the sediment. We can find living organisms down to 10 centimeters. Now, this was a model I proposed for foraminifera, but since macrofauna people have taken it up to explain the vertical distribution of macrofauna in a similar way. So the question is, what is new since 20 years? Well, first of all, I'm glad to say it works, more or less, my conceptual model. And because of that, it is cited quite often. This is an adaption of uh, my student Christophe Fontanier, who adapted this model regionally for the Bay of Biscay. So here you see different stations. We go here from the outer shelf, 150 meter, that's eutrophic, to 2,000 meter, which is oligotrophic. And now we can put names on the scheme. We see exactly the same thing. So we see that the most, the best microhabitat succession is found between 1,000 and 500 meters depth, mesotrophic ecosystems. And we see as well that there is a shift in species when we go to outer shelf, 2,000 meters depth, we see a relay of species. And these species respond, of course, to the food supplies, which are very high here in shallow water, which are much lower in deep water. Next, we saw that in submarine canyon settings, we had very interestingly deep informal taxa which made huge concentrations. Here we see a record down till five centimeter sediment, five centimeter in the sediment. We are at 3,000 meter depth, more or less. We see a relatively poor surface fauna, but at five centimeters depth, Around the zero oxygen level, we see suddenly the maximum of the living population. And that suggests very strongly that there are two main epicenters of organic matter uh, degradation. That's first of all the, center, the sediment surface, which is a short-term system, which responds in a very quick way to arrivals from the sediment, from the surface waters. And next, we have a much slower system going on deeper in the sediment, associated with specific redox fronts. I'm supposed to talk until what moment, what time? 
Okay, then I'm. Then I don't have to hurry. Then I will do it calmly. Now, one of the questions is, I will, I will forget this idea. It's nice, but I will show it later, if we have five minutes on the third day. So there appear to be two organic matter mineralization loops, one at the surface and one deeper in the sediment, which is an old idea which has been uh, presented by Tom Crawley, who is a macrofauna person, 30 years ago, but nobody took it up. And here we have some proof. But when we tried to model this, it didn't work. There couldn't be two different loops because my modelers, they tried to diminish the reactivity of the organic matter and they never were able to make a system with two maxima like this. But still, we find it, we observe it. Modelization doesn't really appear to be the case. So this is uh, work together with Boris, Boris Kelly Garain, who formerly was at Southampton. You may know him. No, he left unfortunately five years ago, more or less, to Australia, where he took up a completely different job, and that was uh, the end of our work in progress. So if there are any modelers in the room who are, would like to take it up, they are more than welcome. So you see that for here for a 1,000 meter station. We modeled, first of all, the chemical species, the early diagenesis, the TUC, oxygen, nitrate, ammonia, uh, I don't know what this is, oxygen diffused units. And then we had foraminiferal species, hypothetical species with certain characteristics, which were fed into this biogeochemical system. And with that, we tried to simulate the real distributional patterns, and it went quite well, I think. Except that with competition alone, we didn't make it. We had to do this, and that's one, one of the things which were, why it's not finished. In order to keep the deep informal species in the sediments, we had to inhibit them for oxygen. Otherwise, they kept keep coming out of the sediment to the sediment surface. The only way to keep them in the sediment, keep them down there, was to give them an inhibition for higher oxygen values. And we know that's not true. So that's where we were stuck in the model, and unfortunately, that's where we are still stuck. But what I want to show, yeah, another point is that we couldn't really model two well-separated biodegradation cells either. So, rather different reaction velocities in aerobic and anaerobic ecosystems. Still two loops, but they are not as well separated as we thought before. So the question then, of course, is why do we have such a big maximum within the sediment? And personally, I think that these deep sediment layers work as a trap for certain foraminifera. When they arrive, because they random move, randomly move through the sediment. When they arrive at a site where there's no oxygen, they, slower, they lower their metabolism, they become inactive, but they survive for a very long time. And in this way, they wait simply till the system gets better. But deep in the sediment, it never gets better, so they are stuck for the rest of their life. And I have the idea that that's the main reason why we have an accumulation of living individuals at depths, and it's not, the, not really because there's more uh, biogeochemistry going on. Well, of course, the next very important finding is that indeed foraminifera, in, and we found that there is indeed a whole group of foraminiferal species. Actually, most species are capable to do this. Species who are not capable to do this is rather the exception which is extremely interesting, which made us, saw, made us think that from an evolutionary point of view, foraminifera exist probably, the, 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 since the Precambrian, probably the anaerobic pathways was first developed and the aerobic pathways came later. That's at least the idea I have at the moment, but Johan doesn't believe it at all. Which would be logical because the origin of foraminifera is somehow in anaerobic ecosystems in the Precambrian. 
or low oxygen, not very well oxygenated ecosystems. Well, when you want to use nitrates, there are two possibilities. Either you live in ecosystems when there are nitrates, like the ones the intermediate in fauna, or when you live in an area deeper down still, where there is no more nitrate, somehow you go to the gas station, you fuel up, and then you go down again and you use your nitrates till you're, till you're empty and you go up again. In order to do that, they have to be capable to store nitrates in their protoplasm. And we could since show that a lot of species are capable to store nitrates. Here you see huge amounts in picomol per cell of nitrates which are measure, measured within the cell. But there are some exceptions and that's very interesting. Here we see nonial scarfum, Juvigerina peregrina, we see bulimainas, and we see melonus. And now some of these species are intermediate in fall. It's very interesting that some species are not capable to store nitrates in their cell. They are living in the zone systematically where there are plenty of nitrates in the pore water. So they don't need to store it because they are living in it. So it more or less seems to make sense. Well, here you see such uh, intermediate informal species. Here you see species which, these are six or seven different stations offshore the Rhone Delta, systematically a maximum uh, at about one centimeter depth. Here you see, there's another way to present this is on the shelf. Here you see a species with a maximum of about two centimeters depth below the oxygenated zone, they are really living in the nitrate zone. Okay, if they can respire nitrates, so the ones who live in a zone where there are nitrates, they don't need to store them, the others do. So do they migrate then? Do they go up and down like a yo-yo to fuel up with nitrate? And then the question, of course, is how long can these species survive fully anoxic conditions? Because we know from the geological record, when we have long-term anoxia, benthic foraminifera disappear from the record. So we started doing experiments. Previously, in lab experiments, we thought that they could survive a couple of weeks. Now, two, three years ago, together with the group of the Marine Biology of Vienna, we made in situ experiments with benthic chambers which became anoxic and which we kept anoxic for 10 months in the Adriatic Sea. Big surprise, here you see normoxia, nine days, one month, two months, 10 months, almost nothing changes. The densities after 10 months of anoxia in our benthic chambers were just as important almost as at the beginning which was a big surprise. We know to the other experiments, we know that they can even calcify under anoxic conditions. Here we see the same record for about nine different species, and we see that this applies to most species. Almost all species could survive 10 months of anoxia. Another major surprise. Actually, there's only one species which disappeared, which is a miliolid, the quinquilocalina, which is most sensitive. We knew that already, but all others survived. Now, this is, of course, not so surprising because in this northern Adriatic Sea, that's an area which naturally experiences anoxic periods almost once a year. So there has been an important selection which has been made naturally. So the species we have been testing were already selected by nature because of their resistance to low oxygen. But still, nine different species. And then, of course, we tested all those species, whether they stored nitrates, whether they could respire nitrates. And then we had again a big surprise. Most of them could not. Because the guys who can respire nitrates, they're all deep sea species. And here we are at about 30 meters depth. So there must be other metabolic pathways, other survival strategies. And until today, we don't know what other survival strategies they are. 
Do they simply lower their metabolism? That's one way, dormancy. And why do they disappear? Because they stop to reproduce? Still a lot of open questions, as you can see. So I come once again back on labile organic carbon and the quality of organic carbon. I already showed you a couple of arguments to say that is really the main parameter controlling foraminifera faunas. It's not oxygen, as our community thought for a century. Oxygen plays a subordinate role. The more we look at it, the more we get that ID. So here I have some work of Carolina Coho, where we have these vertical lines you see here. This is the concentration of phyopigments, which are indicative of the organic matter quality. And with these lines, they are difficult to read, these diagrams, you see the percentage of the animal. And these are different redox zones. So this is oxic, this is disoxic, this is anoxic. And you see now that some species, like our deep infernal ones, this one and this one, they can survive very low organic quality conditions, whereas other species, you see, they depend much more on higher organic quality. So that's another proof that the quality of the organic matter is really most important. Now another thing, and I'm almost at the end, another thing we found is that macrofaunal bioturbation, of course it may mix up the species succession which I showed you. And I think Paul Hubert had a paper about two years ago where he attacked the truck, the truck model. He said, no, it's only bioturbation. Well, it's, it's not true. Of course, bioturbation can mix up the normal distribution of foraminifera. But still, here we have such an example at 1,200 meters. And now we are somewhere completely different at the Cap Blanc upwelling area, which is extremely rich. Extremely rich ecosystems with very rich macrofaunas which mix the whole sediment. But what's so funny, we see now that we find foraminiferal species down to eight centimeters depth, because there's a lot of organic matter, because of this bioturbation, introduced into the sediment. But what we see is that our Melonis balianus, which is an which is a intermediate informal species, it's sitting there, between one and a half and one centimeter, and here you see oxygen. Oxygen goes out at about one centimeter's depth. Nitrate, it's this curve. So it's still sitting exactly at the right place. Kilostomella, which is a deep informal one, it's sitting between two and three. And of course, a lot of these surface taxa, they are buried down. But still you see that the whole system, when there is bioturbation, it, it, it recovers very quickly and you still see that these typical species are sitting at the right place. Another example from uh, an upwelling area on the Portuguese margin, 3,000 meters depth, where we see here a deep infernal species at about two to four centimeters depth. There is lots of other species which are bioturbated into the sediment, but which progressively, as soon as they are bioturbated, they try to get back to the sediment surface again. And now something interesting is coming out. We have two different groups, two different wall structures. On the top, we have calcareous foraminifera with a calcareous shell. In the bottom part, we have agglutinated foraminifera, which make a shell of agglutinated, by agglutinating together sand particles, basically, and other microorganisms sometimes. And when you look at the distribution, now every bar is one station, and we go from 1,000 to 5,000 meters depth. We see that these calcareous species are quite well concentrated at the sediment surface, except this one, Globocastellina, whereas the agglutinant species, they are found alive much deeper in the sediment. Now, part of this is because these agglutinated species, they can live with lower organic matter quality, but part of it is as well because the calcareous species have a large capacity, once they are transported, to move back to the sediment surface, whereas this capacity is much lower in the agglutinate species. When you move them to a deeper sediment layer, they are basically stuck. So perforate taxa are better to migrate back to their preferred habitat, 
after deplacement than agglutinants. And we have also the idea that there is a limit on this, that these, even these uh, carbonate species, they can only migrate back when they are not too deep. For that, we have some experimental evidence. Here we have an experiment with oil, because we have to try to, uh, to see the impact of oil spills on the benthic faunas. And here we have the, we mix the sediment. So at the beginning of our experiment, everything was completely homogeneous in depth. And after four weeks, we saw already that the foraminifera living between 0 0.5 and 2 centimeters depth got very poor, whereas the number doubled in the first layer. So we have a clear indication in both replicates no, the, that they migrate back to the sediment. But the ones deeper down, apparently they don't make it. They are lost forever. And here we have another experiment where we incubated cores in anoxic and hypoxic conditions where we see exactly the same thing. After 15 days of anoxia, we see that a lot of specimens migrated to the sediment surface from this layer, but the deeper ones, apparently they weren't capable anymore to find a way back to their preferred habitat. So this comforts more or less my forum trap hypothesis. I really want to show you my model, but I will do that in two days if you want, want to see it. I'm not a, at all a modeler, so this is a, a very bad model, but it's, it's nice anyway. So this you, I showed you. So we are back now to the, the nitrate. Comfort, okay. So what else did we find? So here, I'm, this is one of the last slides. We are talking here about oxygen concentration. So the whole talk is more or less to explain you that not, oxygen is not really a major factor the foraminifera appear to be very well adapted to low oxygen environments. And this is another way to do it. Here we are in the Arabian Sea oxygen minimum zone where oxygen is extremely low, two micromolar or something like that. And there suddenly we see at the sur sediment surface, we see the appearance of endemic species which locally adapted to this low oxygen. So that's another way. It's not always these deep informal ones. Sometimes we even have local evolution. So to conclude all of this, the longer and the better we look, the more we get the impression that foraminifera are key players in low oxygen environments. They are very unimportant in oxygen environments. They account for about one or two percent of the total degradation of organic matter. But when we go to very specific systems or slightly deeper in the sediment, they can account for one third or even half of the organic matter degradation. So we shouldn't underestimate their role in such ecosystems. They are, in fact, very important. Next, for a microhabitat micro-habitat selection, I would almost say ecology in general of deep sea species appears to be mainly related to the availability of labile food particles, and for all of these species, oxygen appears to be a minor factor. Well, the survival mechanisms, we work on it, but still poorly understood. How do they cope with total absence of oxygen? How do they manage to survive? Disappearance of foraminiferal communities in long-term anoxic ecosystems is not caused by a strongly increased mortality, that's happened by now, but probably rather by an inhibition of reproduction. Apparently, they don't reproduce anymore. Finally, a comparison of geochemical composition of surface and more deep informal taxa, and now we're coming to the application, in my opinion, has a large potential, which is still largely unexploited. What we should do is look much more compare these species with different microhabitats, and I think this comparison in the past can learn us a lot of what went on in the sediment. Okay, that was it. Thank you very much.